It's good to be back in Boston. Uh, I haven't been here since I, Boston broadly defined. I haven't been here since 1966. I was two years old when I left and it looks the same. Uh, except I didn't recognize anybody anymore. I, uh, if it, maybe I saw a playmate, but uh, I didn't recognize the face. As I walked toward Cambridge last night, I passed through the public garden and my favorite childhood picture book, storybook was Robert McCloskey's Make Way for Ducklings. And I recognized the public garden and I was moved to the point of being a little choked up to see this actual place so beautifully depicted. And what I recognized was that while I had long realized that Robert McCloskey was guiding us as children through those books into appropriate gender roles and to appropriate family structures, he was also telling us something about urbanism. The public garden was a refuge from what to the ducks was actually a rather violent city, a city where you could hope that the authorities like the policeman Michael would protect you. But on the other hand, you could easily be misclassed as the troublemaker or the outsider or the intruder by virtue of merely of being a pedestrian in the city. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how we got to the urban ground floor, which I have to admit was an entirely new concept to me when I got the kind invitation to join you all today. I don't think we can understand the status quo without understanding the history that got us here. I think we are much too hasty to assume that obstacles such as American culture, for example, or values such as individualism stand in our way of a more inclusive, open, sustainable, healthful, mentally healthful, physically healthful urban ground floor. I think actually history is one of our best tools, a necessary tool toward a future that we actually may prefer and need urgently. Uh, I noticed um, in Andres's comment about the scholar who had presented to us three Los Angeleses, that that scholar said to get the third right we have a lot to learn from the first, and indeed we do. Those early grids, those early people-friendly streets evolved in an era when energy was not only expensive, but recognized as expensive. We've had the illusion of cheap energy now for a century. It wasn't cheap in the sense that it was borrowed from the future in multiple ways, both as a finite resource and as a climate changing, changing agent. Um, and thus, if we want to get the future right, we have to have the humility to learn something from how a past managed with far less energy intensivity. This is 38 days ago. Actually, this is 31 days ago, but it's at about an event 38 days ago in San Francisco at 4th and King Streets. These people are protesting. They were Most of them are volunteers for Walk San Francisco. They're protesting street conditions that culminated in the death of a four-year-old child uh, 38 days ago. Her father was pushing her in a stroller. I think it's already significant that a four-year-old's pushed in a stroller. That's a protective parent usually, because four-year-olds usually can walk on their own. The mother was a few paces behind and watched as both her husband and her daughter were run down. And the child was killed and the father was seriously injured. The motorist was following the law, taking a wide-angled right turn from a central lane on 4th Street onto King Street, striking where that yellow bar is, uh, the father and his daughter. This was uh, dangerous by design, as the critics of this sort of design are telling us. And people have been protesting there. And these protests have a history. They are saying children, parents, people on foot belong in cities. The urban ground floor is a space for them, if for anybody at all, it's for people on foot or people in wheelchairs or people on human powered two wheelers. How else, how, how could it be for anybody else before it is for them? There's a long history to this and history is on the side of these protesters who are too easily perceived today as on the fringes. Actually, they're in the mainstream. Uh, here we see a California Supreme Court ruling from 1877, 
where the lawyers for a seven-year-old boy or for his parents argued to the court, and I quote, in cities, children have a right to play in the streets unattended, and it is necessary for everyone else to look out for them. Now, this was a very mainstream ruling. These were two lawyers who said that to the four justices of the California Supreme Court, and all four unanimously concurred. All four justices affirmed their position and said, indeed, the street is for children. Children have a right to the street. If anything, they have a prior right to the street over somebody who's merely transacting business passing through. This was the mainstream view. I could use dozens of other court cases as examples. I, this is not an unusual one that I selected for its unusualness. The reason we have forgotten this is because of a successful revolution self-described as radical by the people who promoted it. On November the 9th, 1922, the editor of Engineering News Record, which I bet has a lot of readers within 100 yards of us right now, today, it's still a, an engineering publication. Engineering News Record editorialized that the obvious solution lies only in a radical revision of our conception of what a city street is for. Those are his words. The author of these words was Edward Marin. Edward Marin was the editor of Engineering News Record. He was also a road builder in the cement business who went on to become president of the Portland Cement Association, which is the trade association representing the national uh, cement industry. So his radical revision, and I wanna stress radical, he knew what he was talking about. He was up against the status quo. Those of us who are up against the status quo are ipso facto radical. And Edward Marin recognized that this was a long shot, it was far-fetched, but if he could redefine, and if his allies in motordom, as the interest groups of that era called themselves, who were in favor of an automotive future, could <laughs> align, form a coalition, and demand changes in laws, social norms, and engineering standards, they could privatize the urban ground floor and recommit it to the movement and storage of motor vehicles. That revolution they pursued with great imagination, vigor, and resources. I really admire their recognition that it was gonna take a full multi-front campaign to make this work. Psychology, law, engineering standards, everything had to change if this radical revision was gonna to have to work. And above all, you're going to have to reach children at an early and impressionable age because then they would grow up uh, believing what you had taught them in school about what and who streets are for. This is, in other words, a recognition of the right to the city dating back at least to 1871 in that court case, but obviously far further. The right to, to the city is almost the presumptive uh, uh, view of the pre-automobile age. Uh, in the way Henry Lefebvre put it in 1968, was that when we reduce streets and the public realm's purposes to exchange value, we omit countless other uses that we don't recognize as having exchange value. This view is the view also that you find across the political spectrum in all kinds of different perspectives. We sometimes think that what happened was that our cities were reduced to a utilitarian standard, a cost benefit analysis, but the innovator of this utilitarian metric himself said that that was a bastardization of the term. In utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill attacked people who restricted this term to exclude things like pleasure. He called this a shallow mistake and absurd. If you reduce it to exchange value, then with those with the most to exchange will exclude the others whose other uses of the street lack this metric. It's a mismeasure of the street then to measure it in ways that exclude things like the play that seven-year-old John Shearhold was engaged in in San Francisco when he was killed uh, in the street on Powell Street in uh, San Francisco. We see this view, of course, also in Jane Jacobs uh, of the many possible moments of confirmation I think my favorite is in the last chapter where she faults the planners of her era for reducing cities and their residents to grains of sand or electrons or billiard bar balls that you count and then you calculate what you will do on the basis of those billiard balls or those grains of sand that you chose to, to count. So there's, I think, a, uh, a consensus, if not a, a unanimity here, 
that cities can't be and must not be reduced to the kinds of exchange value and the kind and, and even by that standard uh, reducing it to let's say vehicular three throughput is the worst kind of absurdity to use John Stuart Mill's terms. Now, I wanna speak briefly about a man named Miller McClintock. Perhaps some of you heard of him. He was a Harvard graduate. This book began as his Harvard uh, dissertation. He got the first doctorate in traffic engineering, although the truth is it was in municipal administration. He just said it was in traffic engineering because his dissertation was about that. This was the first textbook of the automobile age. It was published in 1925. And McClintock's position was ambivalent. He did not want the radical revision in streets that Edward Marin won. At least he didn't want it yet because he had an optimism that with science, with measurement and with regulation, he could preserve old street values while at the same time accommodating uh, drivers as well. Um, but his situation when he was writing this book was intensely fraught. So the book came out in 25. These charts are all from the 1920s. They show you rapidly rising numbers of people being killed in streets by motor vehicles. And as you can see in cities, Philadelphia accounts for the bottom two charts. In cities, the people struck were overwhelmingly people walking, most of whom never drove a car and didn't own one and had no uh, skill at driving or no capacity to drive. And also they were overwhelmingly children. The longest bar on that age bar graph is for the four to eight year old segment. This was an era when children's right to the street was understood universally, unquestioned, to the point that when a child was struck in traffic, and I can tell you this with confidence because I've read the newspapers by the thousand, no one blamed the parents. No one said, where was the parent? None of that. No one even blamed the child. They blamed the motorist without question. It was reflexive, it was automatic. Now, McClintock wanted to argue that the rapidity of movement, which is what made motor vehicles dangerous, if regulated, and that would include pedestrian regulation, would reconcile these antagonisms. To me, McClintock reminds me enormously of Gorbachev, a man who wanted the Soviet Union to work while at the same time wanting to lift the restrictions through perestroika and glasnost. And we know that in the end, you could have the Soviet Union or you could have perestroika and glasnost, but you could not have both. This is what Miller McClintock gradually figured out. And he had to choose sides. And when motordom came knocking on his door, as it did, and said, we'll give you anything you want. And I'm quoting him. He said, they told me they'd give me anything I wanted. He was a bit of a nerd. So he said, I'd like to run my own national traffic agency and I'd like you to fund it. They said, fine, we'll set you up at UCLA, where Anastasia is from. Uh, they soon re relocated to Harvard. It was at Harvard. It was called the Albert Russell Erskine Bureau of Street Traffic Research, named for the president of the Studebaker Automobile Company. And remarkably, McClintock started finding out that the way you make traffic work in cities is to restrict the pedestrians and increase the speed limits. It followed quite automatically almost. And that's, that means that the original vision of this 1925 textbook, the first textbook of motor age traffic engineering ultimately proved untenable and it was overturned in that radical revision. Up against motordom were views like these, and I'm quoting these deliberately because they are mainstream views. This is the editor of the Muncie Evening Press, uh, about as mainstream a newspaper as you'll ever get. Streets belong to everyone, and therefore we cannot exclude others on some specious measure of value or something like that. But this is not uh, the only kind of obstacle that motordom faced. This is a New York Times uh, article, and it's notice that the illustration shows you that the victims of the automobile are people on foot in the middle of the street. They are still presented as the innocent victims. The automobile is de de demonic, its driver is demonic. The traffic regulations of that era were based on this assumption that people have a right to the street. This is an engineer named Guy Kelsey saying, you know, when people cut corners like they did in San Francisco 38 years, 38 days ago, killing that four-year-old girl and injuring her father, that it is the driver who is at fault. That is not the legal situation as it stood following that death in San Francisco. Rules in city streets, and this is a typical one, required left turns like this for a reason, because you practically have to stop to make a turn that sharp. 
and they wanted to slow cars down. They didn't have radar detectors or automatic speed detection. So instead, they just made up rules that would force you to go slowly. They put a post in the center of the intersection called a silent policeman. And they said, you have to pass that thing before you begin to execute a left turn. This was practically every city in North America was like this. The people who were killed were honored as the victims of a public failure to protect their, their own citizens. This is a monument in Baltimore being dedicated 100 years ago, 1922, by the mayor. That's Mayor William Broning speaking. And that monument is to the children killed the previous years and the previous year in the streets of Baltimore. Uh, these monuments were imitated in numerous other cities, Baltimore being one of the first. The blame, as you can see, was very strongly on the drivers and especially on the speed. And because of the speed being blamed, and of course, if you know something about Newton, that's a pretty good place to blame. Um, this means that the logical solution at that time was automatic speed control in the form of mechanical speed governors, which were proposed all over the US. But here you see a coalition uniting against the speed governors, equating them with the Great Wall of China on commerce. So this is where we get that obvious solution. This is what Edward Marin was responding to. That's Edward Marin himself. He's the man who called for this radical revision. He's raising his fist in what I interpret as mock radicalism because he called himself radical. It may also be a reference to a new anti-jaywalking ordinance in Los Angeles that Miller McClintock, remember him, wrote. And according to that ordinance, to cross a street, even at a legally marked crosswalk, you would have to raise your hand like Marin did. What Marin's trying to do is reverse this pyramid. I think he was he and his allies were substantially successful. And that raised fist is emulating this idea that if you're going to cross the street, you have to raise your hand first. This part of the J.O. Walking Ordinance was later dropped, but the rest of the ordinance, it probably applies to the streets right outside this building today. That's where it began. And Marin led this effort to spread this idea across the US through a model municipal traffic ordinance that he helped write to sell concrete and instructing people to stay out of the streets on the grounds that if you're in them, you're jaywalking. The gasoline tax was a intellectual justification because after all, you're not buying gasoline if you aren't driving. This means roads are paid for by the motorist if that's where the revenues go. And if they're paid for the by the motorists, what we've done is commodify the street. That is, we've reduced it to a transaction and the driver now owns the street. This means children can be told that the street is for autos, which is what this page from a coloring book was teaching children. Every time their eyes passed over the model that you were supposed to imitate in the lower panel, you saw that the street is for autos. Once this message is out, the Auto American Automobile Association says we can raise speed limits. Why? Because we've got pedestrian regulation now, that means it's safer to drive fast. You also had to teach children that it was their responsibility to cross streets safely. This is the Chicago Motor Club in 1930, telling teachers how to teach children that the street is not for them. Um, and the culmination of this, and where I'm, where I'm going to sort of draw an arbitrary line on this talk, is with the textbook of 1941, paid for by the Erskine Bureau of Traffic Research, which by then was funded by the Motor Vehicle Manufacturers Association, then called the Automobile Manufacturers Association. They paid for this whole traffic bureau. It moved to Yale, by the way. And at Yale, Maxwell Halsey wrote that uh, we should teach children to stay out of the street. These posters are from the American Automobile Association. Notice that they're teaching children even to surrender their legal rights, not just to be scrupulous about following the rules. But in all three cases, these posters from 1940 and 41 are teaching children not just to be careful, but also to surrender their legal rights for just to survive. Now, Maxwell Halsey, the textbook I wrote about, his diagram for the way you manage an intersection is the diagram that gave us the death in San Francisco 38 uh, days ago. It superseded the, the center and left-hand panel which are the 1920s standard. What he's saying is we need wide right turns because streets are for cars and if streets are for cars, we need to maximize vehicular throughput and maximizing vehicular throughput is the way to do it. And if people question this, Maxwell Halsey's reply is, well, it turns out everybody prefers to drive. And since everyone prefers to drive and this is a free society, we have to yield to that. Uh, Pointy-headed experts should not be judging people's preferences. 
Now, this was a total fabrication because when he wrote this book in 1941, only about 30% of women had a driver's license. And, you know, so, okay, I guess by people he meant men. But uh, this is uh, this became a self-fulfilling prophecy because once you rebuild a city on the assumption that you're driving, pretty soon people prefer to drive because everything else stinks, right? This is the background for rebuilding cities for cars. That textbook guided it. The cure for congestion is to take a street like this in Detroit, in uh, Paradise Valley, uh, the black neighborhood of Detroit, and turn it into this. That's the same view side by side. Uh, it's basically all white drivers on the right because they're from this, the segregated suburbs. They destroyed that place on the left because of the mismeasure of the American street. We know that in some countries there was opposition to this kind of thing, like in the Netherlands. What we've forgotten is that this opposition was all over the USA too, predominantly by women. And because women uh, were typically stranded alone while their husbands monopolized the car, if there was one at all, they protested this kind of thing. And I'm just scrolling through protests of mothers, black, brown, and white, rich, poor, middle class, everything in between, demanding this. And this history has been forgotten. These protests were illegal. They were, in every case, demanding something to slow down drivers. And uh, with that, uh, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you for being on time. So that actually gives us some time for questions. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yes. yes, Ellen. Uh, maybe jumping now a fabulous history, jumping ahead and autonomous vehicles. You must get this question a lot. So part of the challenge that it, what frustrates a lot of the folks trying to design them is the argument, yes, of course, we're going to increase safety, but jaywalkers can stop them in their tracks and it clogs up traffic and we don't get the throughput, blah, blah, blah. Are you engaged in conversations about this? Kind of jumping ahead, where do you see things? Let me begin, going? Ellen, by saying, yes, I do get asked a lot. And I got asked so many times that I wrote, finally wrote a book called Autonorama, the illusory promise of high-tech driving. It's a sham, it's a fraud, it's self-evidently stupid and absurd in every way. And I stand by every word in that statement. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's ridiculous beginning with the word autonomous. If you want a robot car that won't do anything except what you want it to do, it is the opposite of autonomous. It is absolutely deterministic to the extent that it's not deterministic, it's dangerous, that means the worst nightmare you could ever have is a truly autonomous robot because then it has a will of its own. That's what it means and words matter. And people say, oh, well, we mean autonomous in the engineering sense. Forgive me, but I have to say bullshit. The engineers introduced autonomous in the 1960s when NASA said, we want to equip space capsules with the means by which they can aut autonomously navigate. And if you look at what they meant, they meant they wanted a window in it so the people inside the space capsule could do celestial navigation from within the capsule. That's what they meant by engineering autonomy, human beings making the decision. They still mean that today with robot cars because they want those robot cars to do what the CEOs of the companies want and the CEOs of the companies make sure that every one of those robot cars is being tracked in real time by somebody at a control center who is in effect making sure the car behaves exactly as they want it to, which means the car is not autonomous. I should stop there, but I'll say one more thing, and that is this. The same basic promise has been, been sold to us since the 1930s when um, Detroit had a panic attack and said, it turns out, first of all, people recognize that our products are dangerous. And secondly, a lot of people in cities don't need them. What are we going to do? They called this, by the way, their term, 1930s term, submerged demand. Submerged demand means you have access to a tram or a streetcar or a subway, and we have to do something about that. So what they said is, we'll redefine safety to mean that you put expressways every few blocks, such that when you're on them, you can't have a head-on collision because there's a median strip. You will tell people you can go as fast as you want. We'll call them foolproof highways. There was mass slaughter on them. But when they sold this idea to us, they sold it the same way they sell autonomous cars. And the message was this, amazing technology will make car dependency work. It wasn't true then, it's not true now. I just want to add a small side of the story to uh, Peter's fascinating conversation and link the two comments. So the city of San Francisco, again, 
uh, starting a pilot program. I started a pilot program on uh, Uberless, Uber and Uberless cars. And the people are protesting again because they feel they're very unsafe. And so they figured out that if you put the orange cone on the vehicle, the vehicle stops at its track. And so there is the protest of people. And very nicely, you started your discussion with people really knowing what's safe and what I'm saying, that they're stopping these cars on their tracks by putting these cones and the city doesn't know exactly what to do and the company is trying to reprogram the car so that they don't stop and it's, it's a chaos at this moment. And what they'd like you to believe is that those protests are fringe protests, but in fact, the stereotypes you hear about Americans loving to drive, a lot of it is because otherwise you can't get a job or get any groceries. <laughs> And in fact, protest has been nonstop. It reached its lowest level when by the 1980s, uh, motordom had convinced Americans that you don't have a complete family until you have at least two cars and you drive your child everywhere. But even then the protests never went away. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Thank you. I would just like to know if you've also been working because I mean, that even saying that the speed is for the car, very interesting one. But not just privately owned cars, also public transport cars. Have you worked on that, on the way the road is shared between uh, the privately owned cars and the public transport ones? That intersection is so profoundly important, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows. Um, and in fact, you know, a major reason why public transport failed in the U.S. is that it was using a public right of way that was being privatized in effect by private motor vehicles that meant that streetcars and even buses couldn't maintain schedules. They were all stuck in traffic like everyone else. What I think often gets forgotten in the discussion about the loss of the fact that we had EVs in every city a hundred years ago and that's how most people got around was in EVs. It's, it's um, symptomatic that when we hear the word EV, we think of an SUV with a giant battery that we can never source for, for. when in fact, a streetcar doesn't need a battery except as a, a small reserve battery to make it go in case there's an interruption in the power. But what those street railways had to do, they were all private companies, almost <coughs> all of them originally, but they had to say that they were in a position where the public had a huge amount of leverage because the public said, you wanna use our streets for your private, street railway, well, you're going to have to agree to our terms. And their terms were, you have to serve all neighborhoods, even when they're not profitable. You have to um, charge a, a certain fare. You can't have a greater than a certain amount of return on investment. If your return on investment gets too high, you know, you know then we're going to make you charge a lower fare. Uh, if you want a fare increase, you're going to have to get public approval. In other words, they recognize that when you make a deal with a private company to use public streets, the public has the right to ask for something in return. And we seem to have forgotten that because we hand over streets to Cruz and Waymo and, and, and Zooks and the rest of them. Thank you. Thank you.